Sunday, January the 14th, 2024, 311 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is episode 236 of McRae Live. Halloween 4, part 2? Part 2? Part 2? Is that what's going to be happening? I- no. Uh, so, of course, because the Halloween fan base is rabid and crazy, and because we have exhausted uh, all, uh, anything Halloween, uh, I mean, we haven't done nostril hairs, shoelaces, and uh, kneecaps yet, you know, top 10 Donald Pleasant's kneecaps, but, you know, we've, we've, we've exhausted pretty much everything else. And uh, so whenever there's any little bit of Halloween news that, that, that drops, of course, people get excited about it. I don't consider this Halloween news, <laughs> really. It's just sort of... And the funny thing is about this, too, is that what I find interesting is... is um... Anyways, I don't want to jump ahead of myself. Okay, welcome, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Episode 236. And uh, so, yeah, so... Uh... People in the horror community and, well, not really the horror community, more specific, the Halloween horror community, which is much smaller than the horror community. Um, in our little sort of uh, uh, pocket in the on the internet, um, you know, there was an interview with Dwight H. Little. Dwight H. Little, D-H-L. Uh, who, of course, best known to Halloween fans is the director of Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, a fan favorite, uh, arguably the best sequel, outs, in my opinion, outside of the original uh, Halloween 2. Uh, I guess you kind of have to say the original Halloween 2 or say Halloween 2, 1981. And, uh, of course, you know what? It's not without its issues. But, you know, when people talk about the issues with Halloween 4, it's not usually, you know, it's usually the mask or, you know, uh, th- this or that. The story in and of itself doesn't usually get attacked, you know, in terms of, oh, it's a story. What What's the story? Ah, oh, Michael is in a coma for 10 years. He escapes. Donald Pleasance goes back to, you know, Dr. Loomis goes back to Haddonfield. Jamie Lloyd says, so, you know, people seem to buy into that. Um, but it is no doubt it, it is uh, because everything after Halloween 4 there's such a drop. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why I've often said that it was, in terms of the franchise, Halloween 5 is the movie that destroyed the franchise. Of course, this is my opinion, but I'm just saying that, you know, you can trace everything back to 5 because 4 is like, it's pretty good, it's not bad. And then 5, whew, there's such a there's such a cliff. You know what I mean? There's such a... In, in, you know what I mean? And then, of course, you get 6 because of 5. You get H2O because of 6. You get Resurrection because of H2O. You get the Rob Zombie remakes because of Resurrection. Then You know what I'm saying? So you can kind of trace it all the way back to, you know, Halloween 4 being like the last acceptable one. My opinion, of course. <laughs> Just my opinion, folks. Um, <laughs> anyway, so... why? <laughs> um... So anyway, so there was an interview with, uh, what? Something going on with my internet today. There was an interview with Dwight H. Little uh, from Bloody Disgusting. And uh, uh, this was from a couple days ago, January 11th. So three days ago. And Dwight H. Little, he's written his memoir, He's, uh, you know, worked in the business a long time. He's mostly, I think, worked in television. Um, hang on a minute here. Ba, 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 ba. He, uh, hang on. Uh, yeah, so, hang on, I want to just check something. I want to just look something up because, uh, sorry, this is live, and I just got to quickly do this. Um, oh, he did. Okay. All right. I didn't know that. I probably did know that, but I'm being reminded of it in real time right now. He's also the director of Murder at 1600, that 90s action film starring Diane Lane and Wesley Snipes, I believe. And I actually like that movie. Now, fair enough. I haven't seen that movie in a long time, but I actually like that movie when it came out and uh, he directed that. Okay, cool. Um, I think I knew that. Anyway, so he's worked, you know, he's worked in Hollywood Hollywood for a while. Uh, but like I said, he's best known to the Halloween and horror community as the director of Halloween for The Return of Michael Myers. So this comes to us from Bloody Disgusting. And uh, Bloody Disgusting, 
Uh, time frequently changes perceptions about projects. This is by discussing. I immediately thought of how when the new Halloween trilogy came out, many people gained a greater appreciation for those older films, including yours. I don't know if I agree with the author here. Um, I don't know. I don't recognize the author uh, of this article. Um, I don't know if it's them specifically doing the interview. It probably is. Um, well, yeah, it would have to be, or why would they write the article? Um, I don't think I agree with that. Uh, I don't know if the author's a big Halloween fan. I assume they're a big horror fan because they're writing for Bloody Disgusting, but who knows? Um, certainly whenever new movies come out in a series, it always makes you revisit the older films. But I don't know if I agree that the new Halloween trilogy has made us appreciate the film. Like, at least in my opinion, the films that I already liked in the Halloween series, I still like. The films that I dislike in the Halloween, you know, series, I still dislike. So Halloween Ends didn't make me appreciate Resurrection more or Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 or... No, I still dislike those movies the same as I did before Halloween Ends. So I, I for me, that doesn't ring true for me, but maybe it does for you. Nonetheless, that's neither here nor there and irrelevant to the rest of the thing. So Dwight H. Little says... Uh, that's another movie that was not received very well talking about Halloween 4. It did well commercially, but the critic response was not great. I don't know what the expectations were with Michael Myers. There's an initial resistance to that movie, but later over the years, uh, there have been several reissues on DVD and Blu-ray and so forth. And, um, and of course... Uh, it plays every oh, fucking ads, man. And of course it plays every year. And I think people really love it. Maybe you're right. Maybe the trilogy made them nostalgic for Halloween 4. I, again, I don't know if I a, a, agree with, with that. I, I think just, at least for me, I mean, I mean again, I'm, I'm speaking just on for me, and it certainly didn't make me more nostalgic or less nostalgic or like films I didn't quite like before and now I do it. I didn't feel that way at all. Maybe you did. Jump into the comment section. But I never felt that way at all with the new trilogy. But that's also because my my mind is very much made up on what I like and what I don't like with the Halloween films. Um, it's, you know, I, I'm not new to the Halloween world. I mean, I've been a big Halloween fan since I was like four and that's going back like, you know, 41 years. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my, 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 I'm, I'm pretty like well set, you know, I, I don't think there's ever going to be a day where I watch Halloween resurrection and be like, Oh, you know what? This isn't that bad. No, no, it's, it's that, that ship has sailed. Uh, but that's just me. That's just me. Uh, bloody disgusting says when the recent news that Halloween might be getting a TV series, excuse me, with the recent news that the Halloween, that Halloween might be getting a TV series, would that be something you'd be, uh, would that be something you'd be up to doing? He says, oh, definitely. I know Malik is, I know Malik is guiding that, but it's really Universal's play. I mean, I think they're really, uh, I would love to do it with Alan uh, McElroy. Is that how, you, yeah, I guess it is. With Alan McElroy. Uh, of course, we would have to be invited and I'm sure they have people uh, that they're interested in. So we'll have to see how it all plays out. But uh, sure, I would jump on that in a minute if we could figure out how to make that work. Considering the greater appreciation for Halloween 4, many fans are clamoring for more Rachel and Jamie, particularly a direct sequel to your film. If that would ever come into the conversation, would you do it? Not only would I do it, I've actually pitched it. Ah! Halloween 4 and Halloween fans around the world right now. Ah! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh... He's pitched it. You keep Rachel alive and follow through with Jamie and Rachel. Ellie Cornell is alive and well and living on the East Coast. And I just, uh, I just worked with Danielle Harris and she's a doll. I think that's a great, I think that's a great movie. I think they should, uh, let, let me try this again. I don't have my glasses. It's in the, they're in the other room. Not only would I do it, I've actually pitched it. You keep Rachel alive and follow through with Jamie and Rachel. Ellie Cornell is alive and well and living on the East Coast. And I just finished working with Danielle Harris. She's a doll. See, that was better. I think that's a great movie. I think they should call it Halloween 4 Part 2. 
too. Just be upfront about it and say what it is because that's what it would be. In my own opinion, more than a TV show, I think that would get a lot of attention. Okay, so the article goes on because it's about him and his memoir and his career and and uh, Natty Knox, of course, which was released uh, last year with Daniel Harris and Robert Englund and so forth. So you can read that article on Bloody Disgusting. A lot of other people have picked it up as well. But obviously on this channel, what's the most interesting and fascinating, of course, is the mere mention that he would be totally up for do doing a Halloween 4 Part 2. He wouldn't mind calling it Halloween 4 Part 2. And the fact that he's even pitched that idea. Okay, so uh, here are my thoughts on this. Um, let me say this. Um, at no other point in... Like, I think... Okay, so I, um, at no other point in the landscape of entertainment uh, has this possible reality of a Halloween 4 parts to, Part 2 starring Daniel Harris and Jamie Lloyd. Um, at no other point in history has it been, has the possibility of something like that been more possible than right now because of nostalgia, legacy sequels, you know, studios pretending that the choose your own adventure timelines were, you know, they're not actually pretending, but you know, <laughs> these choose your own adventure timelines because the studios fucked up a long time ago and they're trying to go back and erase sequels that don't, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. So this all exists now. Like it's all part of our reality, nostalgia, the eighties, you know, legacy characters coming back and you know, all that kind of, I mean, look what we're doing with, you know, Black Christmas, right? I was going to say two different things there. I was going to say, then I got hung up. Look what we're doing with Black Christmas, right? Excuse me. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, and look what they did with, you know, The Exorcist, with Ellen Burstyn coming back, Jamie Lee Curtis to Halloween, right? All these things that, you know, at no other point in... Uh, yeah, at no other point, I'm just laughing at myself. Oh, wait, wait, am I going to say that word? Am I going to say this word? Uh, at no other point during the landscape of entertainment uh, is there, was there ever been an opportunity for that idea to be entertained? I'll say, right? Like if you had pitched this, you know, like, you know, Years and years, it's like, wow. it's like anthology films, right? Like at no other point in his, if Halloween 3 had come out today and you had pitched it and, and marketed it, it probably would have done a lot better, right? That's what I'm saying. There's a landscape to horror and entertainment and how forgiving we are now with people coming back and legacy characters and legacy sequels and choose your own adventure timelines and nostalgia and all this kind of stuff. So that's what I'm saying, right? At no other point in my opinion, in the world of movies and horror, uh, could this be a potentiality than right now? Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> but having said that, I still think it's very, very small that you're going to get a theatrically released... Halloween 4 Part 2. I think it's, you know, if it was 0.4% every other era, it's like maybe 1.9%. Do you know what I mean? Like it's up, but it might be up marginally. You know, you never say never. But what I think is more likely, if this was to gain steam, if this was to gain steam, like real steam, I think it's more likely that you might see something, you know, if, the, by the way, I do agree with Dwight H. Little in the sense of, I think this is something you just lean into. Halloween 4 Part 2. Now, I'm not saying that's the best title for it. I'm not saying that's what you, what you, uh, what you say or what you call it, I should say. I'm not saying you call it Halloween 4 Part 2. I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you do. 
but I get the principle of what he's saying. Like, I, I understand what he's saying. He's basically saying, let's not shy away. It is what it is. Like, it is what it is. So let's not pretend that it's bigger than what it really is, that it's more important than what it really is, right? And somehow it's this, oh, wow. No, it's not. It's fucking Halloween 4 part two. It's, it's hilarious, but in all the good ways. Do you know what I mean? And that's basically what he's saying. Let's not pretend like, let's let's call a spade a spade. This is Halloween 4 part two. This is us going back and doing something fun. It's like a tribute. It's a what if. That's what it is, right? So I actually agree with him in the sense of, let's just call a spade a spade. It's Halloween 4 part two, you know? But I don't think that's got a lot of theatrically or theatrical viability to that. Uh, I don't think that's going to be something that's like, yeah, let's, let's fucking spend, you know, 15 million to make it and we'll spend 30 million to market it. But I just, uh, no, no, I don't think it's going to happen. Again, where it might happen is it may happen uh, in a situation where maybe it's a one-off streaming movie. You know, it's like an 85, 90 minute straight to Netflix thing or straight to Peacock or who, wherever, right? Um, I could see that comes out, you know, Halloween 2024. You know, it's a special event, right? They're leaning into it. They're not pretending it's let's connect now. We're gonna connect this. No, no, it's it's a it's a it's a fun thing. They take it seriously. They play they they play it like Shakespeare. They take it seriously. They make a little event out of it, right? You're gonna release it on you know October 25th online streaming. You know, Halloween presents. You know, Halloween four part two. They just lean into it. They lean into it. It is what it is. I mean, at this game, why are we pretending? Why are we pretending that's not hilarious? Because it is hilarious. And when I say it's hilarious, I again, I mean it all in the good ways. I'd sit and watch it. I like Halloween 4, right? You bring back Ellie Cornell. You bring back uh, Danielle Harris. Of course, we're going to sit back and watch. You're going to get the feels and nostalgia. If the story's good, we'll talk about that in a minute and my ideas. Um, but as long as it's competently made and the story's good and it doesn't insult the fans and you don't avant-garde that shit, that's fun. Lean into it. Have fun with it. That's what I mean by it's hilarious. Halloween 4 part 2. That's hilarious. But in a, not in a, in a, pfft, I just mean like in a, yeah, of course you, you have to do that. You have to do that. And you got to do it not to confuse everybody as well. Because what the hell else would you call it? You know, Halloween 4 B. Uh, I don't know. Um, but I don't think you're going to get theatrical viability or interest in this. I think if anything, you're going to get maybe an 85, 90 minute straight to streaming movie, a one and done, that's it, it's over. Or you're going to get a, maybe a mini series. Maybe you get like a four or five part, 30 minute episode mini series. So you end up with like a three and a half, four hour movie anyway. But it's like, you know, it's a mini series. It's like Mike Flanagan's, uh, you know, Midnight Mass, right? You know, it's that kind of thing. There's lots of mini series on Netflix. Just search for them. You know, they're one and done's. They're one and done's. That's the point of a mini series. They don't, ha they don't go on and on and on and on and on. The point is, hey, this is the story. It's self-contained. It's got a beginning, a middle and an end. It's, you know, and this is it. I'm not saying that some miniseries don't branch off and have like cinematic universes. I'm just saying that, you know, I appreciate a miniseries. It tells a story. It needs longer than, you know, 90 minutes to tell a story, but it doesn't need 17 seasons to tell a story, right? That's the whole point of a miniseries. So, you know, you know, you're like, okay, well, I need more than two hours, but I don't need, you know, two seasons or three seasons. So you build a mini series around it. So there you go. Same thing, right? Or maybe they're 40 minute episodes, whatever. It's four 40 minute episodes. I don't know. And, and that's an event, you know, and you market it for Halloween time. It's, it's ha Halloween four part two, the mini series. And again, I'm not saying they turn it into a comedy. I'm not saying they, you know, make it, they, they don't take it seriously. I just mean that I agree with Dwight H. Little in the sense that you lean into what it is. You don't shy away from it. You, you, you don't be embarrassed about it because the second you try to make it feel bigger and more important than it actually is, then it's going to become really hilarious in the other way that you don't want, <laughs> right? It's going to become the actual hilarious where it's like, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. But if you just lean into it and it is what it is, it, it might be really fun. You know, and, but I don't know if you never say never, 
But I think if you build a story that's self-contained over a course of maybe like 90 minutes, it's a straight to streaming film, or you build a mini series, you know, four or five episodes, maybe it's eight episodes. I don't know. I just finished watching a mini series the other day um, that was eight episodes, you know, and that was it. And I watch it and I'm done. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. It's over. Like the story's done. It's over. Now I know with a character like Michael Myers, because he's built on the foundation of, of on and on and on and on and on and on and on, but it doesn't have to be. This is self-contained. This isn't related to Halloween 5 or 6 or H2O or Resurrection or Rob Zombie's Halloween. It's not even connected to Halloween 18 kills or ends. So this, now it would be connected to Halloween uh, 1, 2, 1 and 2 and 4. So you build on that, you know, and then you give it a proper ending. Give it an actual ending where Michael Myers dies or, you know, whatever the, whatever the case is, right? Do it. Why not do it? you know, and give it an ending. And then, and then what you've done is you've, you've given, uh, you know, an alternate sort of fun, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, alternate reality, alternate version, you know, of Jamie's character. And you can have an opportunity to right some wrongs and, and, um, you know, uh, because obviously I know that people were not up, the fan base and Danielle, of course, were not upset that she wasn't able to come back for Halloween six, but even then, would we have been, I mean, all that would have changed, I mean, Jamie was still going to die, although I know there's a version, uh, the producer's cut, where I think she's alive in the hospital. But nonetheless, J.C. Brandy, I think is uh, the actress's name that played her. Um, if they had gone with the theatrical cut, it would have been Jamie Lloyd on that fucking machine getting the thing through her, you know. So, I mean, I think she, I think she still would have died anyway. But nonetheless, maybe this is an opportunity where you can right some wrongs, so to speak, and you bring back Danielle and you bring back, you know, Ellie Cornell and, 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 you know, she's alive and, and there's a lot of, yeah, I mean, what happened to her, right? I mean, we last saw her standing at the top of the stairs. She's seven years old. She's got, you know, the scissors in her hand and the clown costume. No, no, my God, no, you know, it's a lot. Well, what's happened in the last 40 something years? It's been nearly 50 years. So what's happened in that, in that time, right? Or it's been nearly 40 years, excuse me. So what happened in that time? And, uh, and that's, you can dive in, but you don't, but that's not necessarily something you've got to go on and on and on and on and on with, right? Make it a mini series, make it a five part mini series, 40 minute episodes. That's, that's long. That's like, what is that? 40 minutes times five, 40. I mean, you're looking at at least four hours at least. Right. So, I mean, at least I think my math is not very good in my head, uh, but you know what I mean? It's long. It's long. So that might be something that might be interesting. But again, you lean into it, lean into it. Don't shy away from it. It is what it is. It's Halloween four part two. It's a one-off event, you know, that's going to be a lot of fun. It's for the fans. They're going to make some money. Fans are going to be happy, but, uh, and then that's it. Now, if this thing gains steam, that is what I think is the likely scenario of where you would see something like that. I don't think you're going to see, you know, well, it, like this is the new direction that they're going to take the Halloween franchise. You know what? We're going to go back now and now we're going to start with an alternate Halloween four and, you know, we're going to put 20 million into that. We're going to spend 30 million to market it. You know, we're going to call it Halloween four part two. We're going to put that in the theaters. It's going to get a nationwide release of, you know, 3,500 theaters and it's going you know, we're going to premiere it at TIFF. We're going to, no way, no way. That's, that's the, the, the probability of that with Halloween 4 Part 2 is next to zero. But it could be a fun thing to do. You spend a little bit of money to make the movie, you market it, you put it up on streaming as a miniseries or, you know, a straight-to-streaming movie or something, whatever. And that might be fun. That might be fun. Um, and, uh, yeah. So so those are my thoughts on on, on sort of the uh, that. The other thing, too, is that we have to keep in mind is we don't know when Dwight H. Little pitched this you know when you read the art i mean and we don't know with whom he pitched it to uh was this something he just recently pitched is this something that he pitched 15 years ago you know when they were figuring out what to do after halloween resurrection or no even longer than that 20 years ago when they were figuring out what to do after halloween Re did dwight h little while he was directing some episodes of you know prison break when like hey uh, i got an idea you know, and again, how in depth was the pitch, right? Pitches can be anything, guys, from, hey, I have an idea. Come here for a second. I want to take five minutes and tell you about it. That's a pitch. 
But there's also like actually developed pitches, you know, which I don't think this is what he's talking about, where you have like, you know, a pitch deck, right? And you've got like a, you know, uh, a treatment and you've got like storyboards and you've got like, you know, it's an actual thing. It's like a business proposal. Like that's in film, that's what it would be, right? You know, a pitch deck, you've got everything, you've got a lookbook, you've got all these things where it's like, wow, I can really see your vision. Maybe you've got a rough draft of the script, but you certainly have a treatment and a synopsis. You've got storyboards. Maybe you got an actor who's interested and you got all these things and it's like a business proposal. And that's not what he's talking about here at all, right? He doesn't have that. He wouldn't have time to do that, right? So that's not what he's talking about. So what he's likely talking about is, you know, I, I pitched it, but how did he pitch it? Did he pitch it at a party that him and Malik were at and it was noisy and he's like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> hey, Dwight, nice to see you. What's going on, buddy? Yeah, hey, listen, uh, so how's the Halloween stuff going? Oh, it's going well, man. You know, we're just thinking about doing this. Hey, listen, if uh, if you ever want to talk about like a sequel to Halloween 4, I, you know, I'd be down for it. I got a really interesting idea. What? If you ever want to talk about a sequel to Halloween 4, I have an interesting idea. Halloween's a whore? No, no fuck. No. Halloween 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You directed that. Yeah, yeah, I know I did. But if you ever want to talk about it, maybe like a sequel to Halloween 4. Yeah, we already have one. You do? Yeah, it's called Halloween 5. Oh, yeah, no, I know. But I mean like a Halloween 4 part 2 kind of thing. Halloween 4 part 2. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be really cool if we kind of like had this idea where we were digital. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, hey, maybe, you know, maybe, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, he pitched it. <laughs> you know, that's a pitch, right? I mean, we'd, or, or was it an actual, uh, hello? Oh, yes. Oh, hi, Malik. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you for taking my call. Yes. Uh, so, anyways, I have this great idea. Oh, sorry. Oh, you want me to come down to your office? Oh, sure. Yeah, no problem. You want to do lunch? Well, I know this really great Italian place around the corner. Okay, all right. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Great, sure. Yeah, no. Yep, okay, thank you. I really appreciate this, Malik. Thank you. Okay, all right, talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. And then he goes out to lunch and they go to that, you know, Italian place around the corner and they sit there for two hours and they're eating, you know, spaghetti and meatballs and like it. And, and he pitches his idea. He doesn't have a lookbook. He doesn't have, you know, um, a pitch deck. He, he does, does a, No, he's just pitching his idea from his head. Well, you know, he's pitching it. That's a pitch. Those two scenarios are pitching. <laughs> now, obviously, I'm going to the extreme to make a point. But all he said was, I've actually pitched that. We don't know when. We don't know how. We don't know to who or to whom. <laughs> we don't know under what circumstances or what setting. Did he pitch it to Malik? Did he pitch it to Jason Blum? Did he pitch it to Danielle? Is that who he's talking about? Did he pitch it to a producer that isn't connected to the, you know, like logically just reading that and taking it at face value, you think to yourself, oh, he pitched it. So we automatically think, oh, he, he, it, it was serious. Like he actually was in a position where, and maybe he was, maybe it was a meeting, but we don't even know when. That's the really telling thing. When did he pitch it? Did he pitch it recently? Did he pitch it 20 years ago? Did he pitch it 10 years ago? I don't know. I don't know. And only Dwight H. Little can answer that. So that's something to keep in mind as well, is that I don't think this is, please keep in mind, folks, that, and I'm not saying it's never going to happen. Like I said at the top of the show, I do think that we are in a day and age now where the probability of something like this happening is far, is, is greater, <clears throat> is greater than it has ever been at any other time. But I still don't think that it, it's, it's, likely. And I don't think this interview with Dwight H. Little and him saying, oh yeah, you know, I pitched that and I would totally do it, uh, is, is evidence of that. Um, you know, I, I think they're going to go off in a different direction. I don't think Malika Cod has any interest in revisiting Halloween 4, quite frankly, although if it'll make money, who knows? The fans, of course, want that because the fans are thinking about it from a nostalgic, emotional perspective. And they think automatically, they think, well, yeah, but listen, if you do this, all the fans will go and see it and you'll make a lot of money. Well, you'll make a lot of money from the fans. But whenever you're pitching something 
uh, at, at this level, it's always about gaining. It, it, it's it's really not. The fans will be there no matter what. You can make dog shit Halloween movie after dog shit Halloween movie after dog shit Halloween movie, and people would go see it. All those people that hated Halloween Ends, if they made a sequel to Halloween Ends, those same people would pay money to go and see it. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? The Halloween fans, I mean, right? The Halloween fans. We're locked in. We're guaranteed. They, it, it's not that they don't care about us at all, but they know they have us by the balls. They know that. So really at the end of the day, it's all about getting new people on board. That's why marketing a lot of the times is geared towards the average moviegoer, right? Where we're always like, oh, why are they showing that? Oh, I don't get it. I don't want to see that because it's not for us. It's for those people that don't understand it and, and need all that, you know, shit in their face. And, and that's what it's for. So, um, you know, again, I, 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 I don't think that I don't think that uh, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't. I, at least not in in a like a major way. And I think fans are, you know, again because we're clamoring for anything Halloween. You hear Dwight H a little say this, and I think it feels like it. Him just mentioning it and mentioning that he pitched it at some point uh, feels like almost a low level confirmation of its real probability you know, in terms of, excuse me, real possibility. It's a real possibility. And I don't think we are any further along to that possibility now than we were before this article came out. Um, I really don't, you know, um, but I'm ready to be proven wrong. And, but the fact that he'd be willing to do it and willing to do it, I believe it's the same writer. Uh, the fact that they'd be willing to do it. And there's no doubt, there's no doubt that Danielle would come back. She'd come back like that. Um, Ellie Cornell, I don't know. She might, she'd probably, I don't know. Is she still acting? Is she retired? She may come back. Um, but certainly I, I, I think that they would totally do it. It's just whether or not Malik, you know, wants to do it. Right. Um, I just don't see it happening really at the end of the day now, but you never know. Now, what would I do? What would I do? Well, the funny thing is, is that this direct sequel to Halloween four is nothing new. We, the fans, have been talking about this for a long time. This isn't a Dwight H. Little invention, you know. I mean, he, yes, I know he's the director of Halloween 4, and he's there saying that I would totally do it, but he didn't come up with this idea, you know. I mean, it, it may, maybe the fan, and I'm not saying I did. I'm just saying maybe the fans did, you know. We've been, and you know this, we've been talking about this on this channel for years, a direct sequel to Halloween 4, right? Uh, maybe, maybe he got the idea from one of us, who knows? And I'm not saying directly from one of us. I'm just saying that when you put something out there on the internet, other people pick it up and talk about it, and then other people pick it up and talk about it, and then it gets to other people, right? You know, it's like if I was beginning to say something like, you know, I don't know, if I said, I, I don't know. Well, you know what I'm talking about. I don't want to take forever trying to say that. But um, uh, so we've been talking about it for a long time. Tony, Michael and I have talked about it on Two Dudes. Uh, we even had an idea for it. Uh, this has been circulating the Halloween circles for years. Um, a what if scenario with a direct sequel to Halloween 4, uh, but with Jamie Lloyd and all that kind of stuff. So this isn't a Dwight Leach little, you know, epiphany. Oh, hey, you know what we could do? No, not at all. Um, so there's definitely a, a need for it from from or a a a desire for it from from fans, right? I think I've talked about this before with Tony Michael, and I think I've talked about it on my own. But I think if you're going to do it, you keep it. If you're going to do it, I think your best bet is to do it in the two ways that, that I said. You do a one-off movie, 85, 90 minutes, streaming. Right, you make it, you know, a fun little event, Halloween part or four part two, or you do it a mini series, right? Four or five episodes, forty minutes each, whatever. Um, you make it small. Uh, you make it small for a couple of reasons, because of budget, but also because it lends itself more into the Halloween, you know, the mood, the atmosphere, all that kind of stuff. You could just do something like, actually, a mini series might be great because you could take like the first two episodes and you know, 
build this up, right? There's a lot of exposition that's going to have to be in there, a lot of showing and telling probably. Uh, Again, there's nothing wrong with exposition as long as it's properly motivated. When exposition gets too exposition-y is usually when the two characters have no reason to be talking to each other because they already know that information. So clearly it's just like, okay, why are these two characters, you know, or it's not, it doesn't feel um, uh, earned, right? You know, uh, there's a lot of people that don't like exposition as, you know, at all and think that you should just show everything. And it's like, well, the, it's it's about balance. If you're ever in a position where you can show and not tell, that's great. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with telling as long as it's properly motivated. These two characters have a reason to be speaking. And the information that character A is telling, you know, um, character B is not just for the audience, it's for character B because character B actually doesn't know that information. So character A has to tell character B that. And by er, by character A explaining something to character B, we as the audience are living vicariously through the moment and getting that information as well. And so as long as exposition is properly motivated and it comes off natural and organic, it's fine. Um, but with something like this, with all that history, where where is Jamie Lloyd? What happened to her? Did she get put away for a while? Did she? What's the relationship between you know Dan, uh, between Jamie and Rachel and all that kind of stuff? You could take that time in a miniseries and 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 build that up over the first few episodes. Let's say it's an eight episode, you know, miniseries or even six episodes, right? You can take the first two and, and build that up. But I think it should be about uh, it should be. My idea, and there's many ways to do it, but my idea is I think maybe Jamie and Danielle are estranged and they've been estranged for a very long time. And uh, this is really about them uh, finding each other again, discovering that relationship again, um, and uh, because they experienced something horrific together. And that's why it was always strange to me to kill off Rachel in Halloween 5. It's, it's a no-brainer to me that you build upon that that Halloween 5 should, and I have an alternate, uh, there's a McCray Live on my channel where I give you my version of what I would have done with Halloween 5, so you can check it out. Uh, just type in McCray Live Halloween 5. Uh, there's probably a lot of them, but anyway, you'll find it. Um, and I've always, you know, said that it, it should, they should have extended off of that. Like, you know, because, again, talking about properly motivated, in Halloween 4, Rachel... Not that she didn't like her foster sister, but she found her a nuisance because Rachel's 17, she's into boys, she wants to go out, she wasn't, and her foster sister is a bit of a nuisance. And by going through what they went through together in Halloween 4, it brought them closer together. So, you know, Rachel should have uh, gone on into the next movie appreciating her foster sister more than she ever has. And that bond and that love brings them together. And, uh, and we should have seen that love continue to build into Halloween five, but we never saw that because they wanted to do some weird fucking thing. And so now here's an opportunity where you can do that. Maybe you have them estranged because I just don't see for, to make it interesting, I think it would be interesting to see them estranged, but again, it has to be properly motivated, has to make sense. How long have they been estranged? Maybe they weren't immediately. Maybe, maybe something happened in the few years after that, where that caused them to become estranged or, you know, whatever the case is, right? Uh, you build on that, the drama of that, you make it interesting because uh, you want to build those characters. You have an opportunity to make them three-dimensional and you can do that. You know, Michael doesn't have to be in the first fucking episode, right? If you make a 90-minute movie, well then, yeah, it's it's a movie, it's a Halloween movie. But if you do a mini series and you do, say, like six or eight episodes, you can really build off that. And then maybe Michael doesn't show up until like episode five, you know? If, if you have eight episodes, well, you've got like fucking, you know, five, six, seven, you have four episodes there, you know, with Michael. But I think you need to build that up again and, and make us care about the characters, make it interesting. Where is Rachel right now? Where is she? Is she living in Haddonfield? Likely not. I, I wouldn't believe at all that these two people are still living in Haddonfield. Certainly not Rachel. Um, you know, and, and maybe she's married. She's got kids of her own. She's got kids of her own, right? Maybe... Um, you know, I don't know. And then just kind of build on that and, and build, you know, that relationship. And maybe 
uh, maybe Jamie is finally being released from the psychiatric ward. Maybe she has been released at certain times, but she wasn't ready. Uh, she's got nobody. She's got no family. Rachel decides to take her in, uh, much to the chagrin of her husband. Uh, you can't bring her in. We have little kids, for God's sakes. Who is this? You know, you build that drama. There's Rachel. You're the girl that stabbed your stab. Actually, you could actually say that she's the girl that murdered Rachel's mom. Because you see, at the end of Halloween 4, we know know that Rachel stabbed her, her foster mom, which is Rachel's actual biological mother, but we actually don't know if she died. We only know that they survived in Halloween 5, but if you do a Halloween 4 part 2, Halloween 5 doesn't exist. So you can actually th then say that Jamie actually murdered Rachel's mother. That brings a very interesting dynamic uh, uh, um, and... Um, uh, and and real rich, deep sort of uh, uh, stuff for the relationship between Rachel and Jamie. What does that mean if Rachel, if Jamie actually murdered Rachel's mom? Do you know what I mean? And that's fascinating. And that would be interesting to find out and discover how have they been dealing with that? Like it's been almost 40 years. So what, is she still locked up? Was she ever locked up? Was she locked up and then released and then had to be locked up again? Is she living in society? Is she a functioning member of society? It, does she work? Can she hold a job? All those things are fascinating to explore. And you know, I think if you're going to do something like that, you do that. If you're going to make it a mini series, don't make it surface level. We'll get to the Michael stuff. The fans can fucking wait. You do this shit. You build it up. You can still feel Michael. You can still feel his presence because it's Jamie Lloyd and it's Daniel Harris as Jamie Lloyd and it's Ellie Cornell, right? It's Rachel and it's Ellie Cornell as Rachel. Like you'll still feel the presence. There might be some flashbacks. There may be, you know, reminiscing and talking about it and all, but you build the characters up. You make them three-dimensional. You make them interesting. You make the, what's the dynamic between the sisters? I don't find it interesting if the sisters are living a happy life together. And I don't mean together, living together. I just mean that, you know, Danielle's fine now and she's married with a couple of kids and Rachel's fine and they're really close and they get together every holidays. And I don't, that's, I mean, listen, you can do that, but sometimes to add a bit of drama and a bit of um, animosity or not animosity, but a bit of sort of uh, 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 distance in the emotional connection because it's the emotional connection that they have to find again, right? So by the end of the miniseries, that emotional bond and that emotional connection is what they find in each other again, right? And maybe uh, Rachel, through that process, learns to forgive her sister for killing her mother, right? And maybe in part of how that's done is maybe Jamie uh, saves Rachel's children. Maybe Michael comes over and comes over. He comes over for coffee. No, but I just mean Michael shows up. Or I, I, again, I'm just spitballing here off the top of my head, right? Things that I would think about. If somebody approached me and, you know, pitched me a Halloween 4 Part 2, these are some of the things that I would be interested in seeing and some of the things that I'd be interested in pitching. You know, and again, you have to flesh all these things out. These are just ideas on a, you know, you know, in a brain. There's no sort of uh, uh, order to them. But but I think it would be important that that's, I think, that is what I think you do. And then you have somewhere to go, right? And may, like I said, part of the reason how Rachel is able to forgive Jamie is that she, that Jamie, I don't want to say sacrifices herself, but maybe she does, who knows, but she's able to uh, put herself into harm's way in front of Michael and to save Rachel's kids or to save Rachel or Rachel's husband or whatever the case is. That's part of it. I'm not saying that's the whole uh, driving force, but that's part of it. And uh, that's fascinating to me. Like that stuff is interesting to me as a Halloween fan, as a, uh, as a filmmaker myself, um, I find that interesting. I would, I would really like to see that dynamic because when we last saw them, things were not good. And like I said, even though Halloween 5 tells us her mother survived, we, we don't have to abide by that. We do not have to go with that at all. We can run with that Jamie Lloyd murdered Rachel Carruthers' mother. Wow. How do you forgive your father? She's not your biological sister. She's not even your stepsister. She's your foster sister. Not, I'm not saying that that's not, you know, but I'm just saying there's no allegiance, you know, it, it, to, to, she's a complete stranger, really. And so to, that's fascinating and interesting to me to navigate. I find that really cool. I find that really, really cool. So, um, 
Those are some of the things that I would like to see. And you make it small. You have some auxiliary actors, like, you know, maybe Rachel's husband and kids or whatever, but you don't make it big. Like, it's not like you got, like, it's a cast of 400. You know what I mean? Maybe you have it in a small town. Maybe you take a risk. No, Michael always has to kill on Haddonfield. Does he? Says who? You know, no, maybe she's living. You, uh, look, if, if you want to keep the Halloween atmosphere, great. Maybe she's still, maybe she's in Indiana. Maybe she's up here in Toronto. They're not going to do that. But I'm just saying, maybe she's up here. We got lots of small towns, very American Midwestern small towns here in Southern Ontario. Let's do it up here. Maybe she's moved to Canada and she lives, you know, just outside of Toronto in a small town. Why not? There's lots of small towns. Autumn, autumn up here. Oh my God. Be amazing, right? Who knows? But if not, which is unlikely, well, they may shoot it up here, but it actually taking place here is not usually how it goes. But uh, maybe she's in Indiana. Maybe she's in Ohio. Maybe she's still in Illinois, but she's in Russellville or she's some other town. I don't know. You know, you can keep it a small town. Keep it small in terms of location. Keep it small in terms of unit moves and logistics. You know, keep it small uh, and just make it about character. Character, 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 character. Make us really fall back in love with Rachel and Danielle and Rachel and Jamie, uh, especially if you're going to be able to get Danielle and Ellie Cornell back on board. And if you do that, then yeah, character, character, character. What's been going on? What's happening? What's their relationship now? I think it would be great if it was estranged and deeply so. And Jamie comes back into Rachel's life in one of 10 ways that it could happen, right? And uh, they're very apprehensive about it because this is the, yeah. Oh, by the way, kids, meet your foster aunt who murdered your grandmother. I mean, that's 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 heavy, man. As Marty McFly would say, or as, yeah. Hey, doc, this is heavy. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's heavy and it is. That's rich stuff to play with there, right? You can have wonderful scenes and character development and dynamic. That's interesting to me. I find that interesting. So I would love to see something like that in like a six to eight part miniseries. And yeah, fucking call it, call it Halloween 4 part two, whatever, because you can. Don't shy away from it. Lean into it. Accept it. Call a spade a spade. It is what it is. Let's do this. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying like, let's not pretend it's bigger or more important than it actually is. You know, it is what it is do that. And at no point in history has it been more likely that that's a possibility because of, you know, the, um, the landscape of the entertainment industry right now and nostalgia. But, uh, but I still think the probability is low that it's ever going to happen. Maybe in fan film form, who knows, maybe in fan film form, you know, but, uh, but again, if you're going to do it, you got to do it. You know, it's got to be pro. Totally pro, right? The problem with Halloween fan films, uh, and I've said this many times because I always get asked, after Billy, are you going to do another fan film? The answer is no. No, uh, you can't make a living, you can't make anything doing fan films. So we chose to do It's Me, Billy, chapter one and two, obviously, as, as a way to flex our muscles, showcase what we can do, pay honor to Black Christmas. Uh, there had never been a sequel to Black Christmas. We're the only ones who have ever done it. Uh, but our goal was to deliver a professional product from top to bottom through and through, which is what we did, which is what we're doing. If we delivered the same production value on a Halloween fan film, or if Vincent DeSanti did the same thing with a Halloween fan film, we'd be shut down. We'd be shut down. We would. Um, because Malika Khan has shut lesser fan films down. He's some uh, owners, some IP owners, some rights holders uh, are more lenient than others. Uh, some really appreciate, even if it looks studio quality, they're like, no, oh, this is great. You know what I mean? This is great, guys. This is great. Because it only keeps their IP in the pop culture zeitgeist. Uh, they love it. They appreciate it. And it's all fun. But there are some people, and it's within their right to do so, that are very, very protective. Uh, and Malika Cod is extremely protective of the Halloween IP. And so there is no way that that we could do that. And like I've said recently, even if I, uh, like, you know, I will never again do the amount of work that I did on Billy one and two and not get paid. 
Like I, it's just, I, I can't, I can't do that. You know, when, when you are, yes, again, like I said, we're delivering a fan film because we have to put that label on it, right? Because we don't own the IP, but what we're doing, what Vincent DeSanti has done, what we've done, you know, it's, it's um, uh, what Cecil even did. You know, we're delivering professional films. And so uh, it's a lot of work. And when you're dealing with the unions and, 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 you know, I mean, it's, it's, we, we can't, I, I don't want to speak for them. For me, I have no desire to do all the work again like I've done for another fan film. No, because we, we, we can't get paid. Legally, we can't get paid. We, it is illegal for us to make any profit. We can raise money to make the movie and pay the actors and crew, but we cannot make money from the movie, right? So we can't seek distribution and make money from the movie. So it's totally not for profit. And, you know, when you're making a real film, and again, I say real film only because of the stigma that surrounds the term fan film. When you hear fan film, you think of shaky camera work with your friends in your backyard shooting on a 1986 camcorder. Uh, that's why I make that distinction. But when you're making a real film, uh, you know, and you're shooting on cinematic grade cameras with real actors and, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, like the, the whole nine yards, um, it's a lot of work, a lot of hard work. And Bruce and I, if we're going to continue to put this level of effort into making films, which of course we're going to do, we now want to move on to original content right? Original content, uh, you know, that we can um, uh, write and produce and direct and uh, seek funding for, you know, and actually make something, maybe a feature film that we can seek distribution for. And then maybe it'll end up on Netflix or Hulu or something and you guys could watch it. You know what I mean? So that's, that's where we're turning our, our, our attention after Billy Chapter 2. So for me, I have no desire to even remotely, it, to even remotely step into, I'll be honest, to even remotely entertain the idea of doing a Halloween fan film with Danielle Harris, because I do not believe it would not be shut down. I don't believe it. I just don't. Malika Cod would shut that shit down faster than you can say police brutality. It's a line from the first vacation movie. Um, but he would, he totally would. And if there's any animosity, and I'm not saying there is, but if there is any animosity between Danielle and Malik, and if you know your Halloween history, then, then you, know, you know what I'm talking about. If there is any animosity there, then Malik Akkad would absolutely see this as an opportunity, if for nothing more than spite, to shut it down. Danielle Harris? <clears throat> I don't think so, bitch. You know what I mean? Like, of course, right? So I, would, I wouldn't even want to get on that. Like, I'm just like, no. There's just, there's, there's no way it, there's just, it's, it's just not going to happen. So the only way it's going to be done is if it's done officially and, uh, and there is an opportunity and there's, a, and there's an audience for it, right? All the Halloween fans would definitely tune in and watch myself included, but I don't see this thing being theatrically released. I see this being more, uh, if it ever gains steam, if it ever is entertained on a serious level, I see it as a streaming movie, a one-off fun little thing, or a one-off miniseries, like six episodes, you know, or what have you. Or what you do is you do what I've been saying for the last number of years, which is you turn to anthology. And you make, I, I've said this for I don't know how long now, you make a, a, a TV series anthology, a, a anthology series called Haddonfield. And you can tell different stories and maybe the first season, and you could have like six or eight episodes in the first season, right? The first season is Halloween four part two. You know what I mean? And it's a fun, like, oh, that's really fun. And then the second season's about something else or, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'm not saying that's the way to go. I'm just saying that there are, uh, there are uh, uh, options that you could go with it. Um, but I don't think Dwight Little saying that he's actually pitched that idea is evidence that it's in any shape or form in development or hot off the press and hmm, things are brewing and not at all. Um, if he had come out and said, yeah, listen, I just pitched that last week to Malik and we're continuing to talk about it. Oh, now that's interesting. Hmm. But just saying, yeah, I pitched that. Basically what he said was, yeah, I pitched that one time. Now he doesn't say one time, but I'm just saying you can add that in there, right? I, I pitched that once, right? But how, where, under what circumstances, how long ago, and most importantly, to whom, right? To whom? Because if he pitched it to Danielle, that's cool, but Danielle's got no say whatsoever, right? So it's hard to say, it's hard to say. Anyways, those are my thoughts. 
uh, on this uh, news about uh, Halloween 4 Part 2. So just to recap, I think uh, I agree with Dwight H. Little. You lean heavily. If it it was to ever gain steam, if it was to ever gain, gain steam and come to be, I agree that you lean into what it is. It is what it is. You don't shy away from it. Let's not pretend it's bigger or more important than it actually is. And again, that doesn't mean Halloween 4 Part Part 2 is the right title. I'm just saying I agree with what he's saying there. Um, I don't think there's going to be any theatrical viability to it or even a possibility of, of them entertaining some sort of theatrically released movie called Halloween 4 Part 2 with Danielle Harris and Ellie Cornell. I don't think it's going to happen. However, I do think, although small, there is a chance that you could see a, a streaming movie maybe or a miniseries, which I think would be kind of fun. Maybe they they do that. Or if they don't want to do it all on its own, they don't want to just do the miniseries Halloween 4 Part 2, they heavily invest and develop a Halloween anthology series where Halloween 4 Part 2 is just one of the stories that they will tell over the course of however many seasons. Do you know what I mean? I could see that. And I could see them maybe trying to squeeze that in there or something. But we don't know what the relationship is like between Malik Akkad and Danielle Harris. Uh, we don't know if Ellie, if Ellie Cornell would have even any interest in coming back. Um, so who knows? Who knows? Let's jump over to the um, chat room now and see what all you are saying. I know there were some super chats that came in, so let me get these super chats and get those questions ready and get them in and let's see what is going on. Okay, the first super chat that came in was from David, who sent in 499, says, my second attempt at a super chat. It went through, David. It went through. Uh, and thank you, for, thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, Josh McKenna sends in 999 and says, I'm about to go back to work from break, but I watched your video about the poltergeist jump cut. Uh, I think it's hilarious that Pizza Hut was so uptight about it. It's so weird. Yeah, that's a deep cut right there. I forgot I talked about that. Yeah, yeah, that's why. It's a weird, awkward jump cut. Uh, Thank you, uh, Josh. I really appreciate it. Uh, Matthew uh, Farisi sends in $1.99. Thank you, buddy. He says, IMB2 is going to be phenomenal. Well, we hope so. We hope you like it. Again, it's the last half of the movie, right? So um, It's Me Billy Chapter 2 isn't really something that you could watch on your own. Uh, uh, Sorry. Of course you could watch on your own. I mean, watch as a standalone without having seen the the first one. Um, So, you know, I advise seeing It's Me, Billy, Chapter 1 first before you watch Chapter 2, or not a lot's going to make any sense. But uh, we hope you guys are like, we hope you guys like it. Uh, we put a lot of hard work into it to complete the story, and uh, yeah, we're now in post-production. So we wrapped yesterday, by the way. We officially wrapped It's Me, Billy, Chapter 2 uh, yesterday. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be, you know, little things we might have to pick up, like ADR or something. But in terms of the actual principal photography, the production, we wrapped yesterday. So we're officially, officially, officially in post-production now. Uh, Carl Weidman sends in $5. Thanks, buddy. Says, how about a new trilogy starting with Halloween 4.2 that goes to 5 and 6? Halloween and Halloween 2 would be canon. Um, oh, excuse me. Ignores 5 and 6. Um, uh, well, a new trilogy, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean like you would have... Yeah, no, if you... Um, Sorry, what did you say? Uh, How about a new trilogy starting with Halloween 4.2 that ignores 5 and 6? I see what you're saying. Well, again, you know, I... (laughs) I get what you're saying. I just don't think you're going to... uh, I I think the probability of a new trilogy of films being centered around Danielle Harris and Ellie Carruther... Ellie Cornell, uh, starting with Halloween 4.2, I just don't see it happening. Like, I'm so confident I would bet the house on it. Like, I, I just don't... I don't see them investing into making a theatrically released movie like they did Halloween 18 and spending all that money marketing and all. I just don't, I just don't see it. Um, I don't think that's the direction Malik wants to go in. And, uh, and like I said, even if they did, I think they would want to make it relatively low risk because they understand the, well, they understand the avant-garde nature of it and sort of the, the, how it could confuse people, even if you call it Halloween 4 Part 2, which again, I agree with what Dwight H. Little is saying, but even if you were to call it that, there'd be so many fucking people that would be confused. You know, we have to remember, folks, there's bubbles in fandom. There's 
a lot of bubbles in fandom. And most people have no idea what the fuck is going on. And then you get to the Halloween fandom and we all know what's going on and we all get it, right? Um, but it, it, it's about appealing to a broader audience, appealing to, a, to, a, uh, to the general movie going audience. However, if you were to downsize, make it low risk, invest a few million bucks into it, uh, make it a straight to streaming film or a mini series, you know, whatever the case is, but you keep it small, you keep it relatively low risk. Well, then your probability goes up, right? Because it's all about, uh, listen, it's, it's, it's show business, right? Um, but do I think that they're going to spend $20 million to make Halloween 4.2? Not a fucking chance in hell. No way. No way. Even 10 million. No, we're going we're to spend 10 million to make the movie, 30 million to market them. No way. No way. No way. It's not going to happen. Maybe I'll be proven wrong, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, Brandon Collins sends in $5. Thank you, Brandon, and says, uh, theatrical is high rent territory. Absolutely. An H4 sequel screams TV. Ellie Cornell runs a, be a bed and breakfast uh, on, on Nantucket and does local theater. She's retired. Um, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Uh, so she's retired. She runs a bed and breakfast and she does local theater. Oh, excuse me. Did I read that right? Uh, runs a bed and breakfast and does local theater. Right. So she's retired. Now that doesn't mean that you couldn't bring her out of, uh, retirement to do it. But I agree with you. It screams TV. Now, what do we mean by TV? Well, 30 years ago, it meant TV, TV, TV now means basically streaming. It can also mean cable TV. Um, but it basically means streaming. And I think you're right. I think it screams either a straight to TV movie. And I don't mean that the production value has to look like a TV movie from the 80s. I just mean it's straight. It's a TV movie, right? Uh, or it's a miniseries. I think if it's ever going to happen, and that's a big if, that's where it happens. That's where it happens. Uh, Howard D sends in $5. Thank you, Howard. Says, uh, hey, bud, been a while. I just popped in to say Halloween 4 Part 2. Hell yes. Uh, well, there's a lot of Halloween fans that would love it. No doubt about it. Uh, Andrew Stevens sends in $5. Thank you, Andrew. Says, do you uh, bring... Do you bring back the H4 mask to keep it uh, uh, to keep it canonically connected or go with the OG mask? What would be the best choice? Well, I think there's an opportunity to not have to. Well, it depends. It all depends, right? Depends on money, rights, how close to the Shatner look can they get? Obviously, uh, you know, what Blumhouse did uh, was pretty great. Um, I don't think there would be a reason to go with the Halloween four masks from 1988, but maybe you do. Maybe you lean into it, right? Hey, it is what it is. Let's not pretend this thing's bigger and more important than it actually is. Let's lean into it. Um, however, I think you would have an opportunity uh, to maybe play around with it and, and be a little more um, a little more uh, Shatner, Michael Myers OG with it, maybe. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but certainly, I don't think he'd be wearing the same mask from 1988. I mean, that would be, you know, that, that, that just rude. So there would have to be where, and where has he been, you know, for 40 something years, right? Or 30 something years. Where, where, where's the mask? Uh, how does he get the new mask? All those things are, you know, be fun to figure out and, and write. But uh, certainly he's got to look like Michael Myers. He's got to walk like Michael Myers. He's got to, uh, you know, and the mask has got to be good. Mask has got to be really good. So do you make it like the OG mask? I don't know. Uh, if you do, you have to justify it. It's got to be justified, right? We see him pick up a new mask somewhere or we get, we don't have to see him actually physically take the mask like we did in Halloween four, but it has to be, uh, it has to be understood by the audience uh, where he got the mask or how he got it. Uh, I mean, I guess you don't have to, but you know, it's, it's an opportunity for you to uh, sort of uh, justify that and, and, and have him. Uh, but how close can he get to look like the OG? I, I don't know. It, it'd be cool if he looked a lot like him, right? Yeah, that'd be really cool. But I don't see this as something that needs to go on and on and on and on and on. I think there's an opportunity here to, you know, right some wrongs and, uh, and, and paint something that's really cool. And like I said, you make it a 90 minute TV movie or you make it a six part miniseries and just have some fun with it. And, but like I said, really, you know, build the characters, build those characters. Um, Brandon Collins, $2 says Malik. Okay, we'll do it. But with the JC Brandy, Oof. 
Could you imagine? Could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine if Malik was like, yeah, okay, yeah, no, we'll uh, we'll do it. We'll do it. But we're not doing it with Daniel Harris. We're doing it with J.C. Brandy. And could you imagine if they do it with J.C. Brandy? But then Ellie Cornell's like, sure, I'll do it. Oh, oh, Ellie Cornell comes out of retirement from her local theater in Nantucket running her bed and breakfast. Thank you for mentioning that, by the way. Brandon, I had no, I thought, I, 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 I thought she was retired that I do remember, but I didn't know what she was doing now. Can you imagine if she comes out of retirement to be in the movie? She's in the movie, but it's not Danielle Harris. It's JC Brandy and JC Brandy's like, sure. I'm not doing much right now. Let's do it. Is she doing much right now? I don't know. Anyway, but she comes out and it's the two of them. Oh my God. I would, listen, I hate, this is the contrarian side of me. I would love it. And the only reason why I would love it is because I know the second that happened, there'd be so much backlash. There'd be so many people. Ah, See, I'm not as emotionally uh, invested into into uh, the Thorn trilogy uh, as a lot of people are, or Danielle is Jamie. You know what I'm saying? But I know a, a lot of people are. Like I, I can still listen. That doesn't mean that I'm I'm, I'm void of being disappointed, or being like, "Why are you fucking serious?" No, no, I I don't mean that. I don't mean that I'm somehow on this. You know, I just mean that. Um, I, I'm not somebody as you guys know, I, generally, uh, not that I haven't had my rants here on the channel, but I'm not somebody that gets caught up in drama and, you know, rah, all that, that just nonsense you see online. But I find it, if that happened, I, there'd be a part of me that would be like, oh, no, they did. Oh, let me check Twitter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, here we go. You know, and I'd be like, oh, this is going to be fucking alive. And then watch, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Could you imagine, what would Halloween fans do? Would Halloween fans have the maturity? Would Halloween fans be able to actually admit if this actually happened, J.C. Brandy was hired, oh, but the show or the movie is phenomenal. It's really good. It's really good. And JC is great. She's great. Because remember, folks, it's not her fault, right? What happened with her, that's not her fault. She's an actress. She's a hired hand, right? It's like Lisa Kovac, who had to step in for Olivia Hussey. It's not Lisa's fault. We're producers. We're making a movie. We got to do. We we, we 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 have to. We have to hire somebody here, right? It's a hired hand. It's a job. It's, it's not personal, right? It's not like you know Lisa Kovac was like, I know what I'm gonna do. You know, no, not at all. It's not like JC was like, ooh, I don't. No, she's an actress. Job came up. She took it. Uh, but could you imagine? It's terrific. Would Halloween fans be able to actually go? You know what? That was really great. It's scary. It's suspenseful, moody, atmospheric. The performances are great. The Easter eggs are fantastic. Michael is fantastic. He looks fantastic. The music is fantastic. The carpenter isms are fantastic. The fall environment is fantastic. Connection to Halloween 4 is fantastic. Could you? Would Halloween fans? Because remember, the story would be, ah, it's not Daniel Harris. You'd have certain level of people. You, you, you'd have some people out there. Some people out there would be like, hey, it's actually really good. And then there would be other people out there that could not bring themselves to like it because, you know, because of, confirmation bias, right? Because they see all the, ah, I just can't do it. I can't. You, you know what I'm saying? They just couldn't bring themselves to, even though deep inside they're like, it's actually pretty good. But they don't want to say that because, you know. Anyways, the likelihood of that happening is highly unlikely, but uh, that is a funny, uh, that's funny. Um, Let me see here. Oh, hang on. Did I get, uh, okay. 
Carl Weidman sends in $5, says, congratulations on wrapping up It's Me, Billy, Chapter 2. Thank you, man. Really appreciate that. Uh, by the way, the uh, N in Weidman is missing. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, the N in Weidman is missing in the membership credits. Oh, okay. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you for letting me know. I will, uh, I will go and uh, fix that for you. Thank you. Uh, Lee the Machine Bauer sends in a dollar ninety nine and says, "For the channel, I'm on bed rest. Oh no, you're sick. Well, hope you're feeling better, uh, Lee. And thank you for uh, the super chat. I really appreciate that. Rest up, rest well. Joshua Green, one of our channel members here, sends in a member, sends in a member, sends in a member chat, and says, "I enjoyed your sequel concept for Halloween Four. Okay, so you, so you, you know the one I'm talking about. You, uh, you watched it." Um, it'd be cool if they did something like that, but I believe you used a young Jamie in that premise, so it would have to be reworked. Uh, DCP, anyone? DCP? Uh, DCP? You mean like, I don't know what DCP is. Uh, there's a couple of things I think it could be. Um... Uh, yes, you are correct that, uh, in the sequel concept that I had for Halloween four that I did on a McRae live a couple years ago, it was, it picked up immediately after part, uh, part, part four. So I think f f for me, I think that that episode was really me talking about what I think they should have done rather than what I think they should do now. Cause obviously, yes, if you were to go back in time and pick up immediately after part four, which story-wise would be really interesting, but you would have to, you'd have to recast everybody. You'd have to recast Dr. Loomis. You'd have to recast Rachel as well. You'd have to recast Jamie, you know, and like, well, I'll just deep fake Rachel. Um, no, you'd, you'd recast. And that doesn't mean you can't do a hell of a job at recasting, right? But yes, no, that is, that is true. Cause I think that was really about picking up from, from where, uh, uh, from where it left off. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I'm I glad you liked it. Thank you. And thank you for the member chat. And thank you for being a member. Davey Deathray, my man, Davey Deathray sends in $5, says, two months ago on the horror show, I pitched the idea of a Halloween legacy TV series that picked up where all of these dead ends left off, including four. I think I remember you mentioning something about that, Davey, and that's cool. That's and that's something you could do, you know, in a Halloween uh, anthology series. So you do like, you know, uh, season one is like Halloween four part two. Season two is a sequel to Halloween three season of the witch, right? Uh, season uh, three is a sequel to Halloween six. Uh, I don't know. Season four is a, a sequel to Halloween resurrection or whatever. Again, the chances of them doing that, I think, is highly unlikely. Um, but I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. I, I think it is... Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. I, I, I have some ideas, sort of, of what I think are possible. But I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's, it, it's just because they've exhausted everything. You know, and I know there's people out there that just want Michael, 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 Michael. But I'm not one of those people. Like, I, I need a break. I, I think I'm just, because, uh, you know, there is such thing as too much of a good thing. There is, there is. And, um, and you know, I, I don't think Halloween, I don't think the Halloween trilogy, David Gordon Green's trilogy was strong enough to warrant, I mean, again, I get, it makes money, it, it, it does, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I think they should hold off and just wait till the 50th anniversary. They're not going to do that, but uh, maybe focus on a video game. I think it would be really cool if Malik Akkad invested millions of dollars into, and I've talked about this on my channel for years. I think the probability of them doing this is highly unlikely, but how cool would it be? And this would cost millions. That's part of the problem. But if they, and it doesn't have to be like photorealism, but how cool would it be if they made a Halloween video game that was open world like Grand Theft Auto? Now, again, Grand Theft Auto has some of the best graphics in the world. I don't mean it has to be like photorealistic, but it's an open world video game where you actually can travel all around Haddonfield. You can get in a car, you can travel down the road. It's, it feels like real time. You can go to Russellville, you can go back to Haddonfield, you can go to the Myers house, you can go to the school and you can play as Dr. Loomis or you can play as Laurie Strode. And depending on certain missions you have to do, it unlocks certain things. So you don't get to play as Nick Castle's version of Michael Myers. Nope, sorry, you have to start out as, you know, shitty mask Michael Myers or something. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, but certain things 
things unlock certain characters. You know, you don't get to play as Annie or Linda. You get to, you know, you have to unlock them. And all. But it's it, it, like the, the, the vision I have for a video game like that is millions of dollars. Like it's because it's got a, there's so many like, and, and there's a map you hit, you know, the thing on the controller and it shows you the map of where you are. And, and it's, it's like really in depth, you know, and it's got different characters and you can go inside. It's open world where you can go into the Myers house and walk up the stairs and around the corner. You're not just confined, um, confined to like a street. It's not just one street. It's not just orange Grove, right? It's the town. It's, actually maybe even the state right maybe you can actually drive to chicago that's probably a little too much maybe it's just like uh haddonfield russellville and smith's grove so it's like a it's 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 a general radius right you can go to smith's grove you can walk in you're dr loomis you play as dr loomis you can walk in you're there you enter you check in you can go to your office you can sit down you can open drawers and all that shit you know there's clues fuck i got to go back to smith's grove to my office to get something that i need for this mission that i'm on right you got like i'm talking about that shit that's the halloween video game i want to see i don't think it's ever going to happen because a i don't think malik i don't even know if he has i mean some of these video games cost as much as major motion picture blockbusters like some of these video games i don't know how much it costs to make grand theft auto but some of these video games cost like a hundred million dollars to make it's insane it's ridiculous so a i don't think malik i don't even know if he has that kind of cash um i don't think his company is is his company worth that maybe it is i'm not sure it could be worth that but even still it's not like you want to invest all that into it um i don't know how much money it would take to make a video game like that again the graphics don't have to be like photorealistic like grand theft auto they have to be good you know but something that just something like that man i'm not a gamer but that's a video game that i wouldn't mind seeing that would get me excited playing as michael myers killing a bunch of girls on a street and it's one street like you know what they did with the dead by daylight and not there's anything wrong with it. i'm not knocking the, the, those things but things like that i'm like eh, okay you know you played a couple of times and like you're it's it's over but you you do what i'm saying you have all the but to get the rights to all those characters, to get the rights to the looks of all those characters. I mean, it's a, it's a real, it would be a real undertaking. It would be a real undertaking. But fuck, man, I would play the shit out of that game, and so would you. Uh, all right, have I missed any Super Chats? I don't think I have. I don't think I have. So let me... Uh, let me uh, go back to the uh, chat room here uh, and see what some other people are saying. See what some other people are saying. Rob Thidoff says, uh, Dave, I would love for this to happen, but how do you explain how Michael survives in 1988? He was blasted with bullets uh, that there's no way he could have survived unless he is now supernatural. Well, I think Halloween 4, I think he is, you know, again, there's, there's, a, there's a spectrum of supernatural, right? There's supernatural, I dematerialize and walk through walls and I'm Slender Man and I'm Paranormal Activity. There's that supernatural. But remember, Michael Myers, the original intention was always to give him a supernatural edge. And all that means is there's an edge, right? There's, there's an essence, He's not literally supernatural. Now, he became, but even in the later sequels, he didn't, you know, we sort of, because of semantics, we sort of just, we, we and I'm guilty of this too, uh, because it would take too long to preface all the time, even though I try to do that with certain things that I think people are not going to get. I don't mean, I just mean people that are going to, you know, it's going to go over their heads because, you know, it's the internet. Uh, and people are going to get angry. But I just mean that uh, uh, it, it's a spectrum right? So there's literally supernatural in the sense of like ghosts, right? Woo! You know, that kind of shit, like, you know, Ghostbusters. And then there's like, there's something a little, hmm, you know, and Michael has always been that way. Michael never became like full blown supernatural in the sense of like, he's walking through, like he's a ghost, you know, and, and walking through walls. I would say that he became supernatural in the sense of that he was like superhuman, you know, in that sense. And so is he superhuman in Halloween four? I don't know. Like, I mean, you know, uh, he was in a coma for 10 years after that fire and that inferno would have burned him to a crisp and he still looks pretty good. Um, so, you know, there's that, right. It's already being kind of silly. I think you just kind of keep it. I think you'd, 
there has to be some level of exp of explanation of what happened in terms of his body, where to go, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you try to explain you try to explain it within the spectrum that you're on, right? So you don't go too far because then it's going to be like, seriously, and you don't give not enough because then it's, people are going to feel like, well, how the, so it, it's got to be within the spectrum of the supernatural of where you are at, at that moment and how you do that. I don't know. I have no idea. I haven't really thought about it. Have not thought about it. Terrence Howell. Hey, what's going on? Terrence Howell. One of our new members here says, I'm sorry, dark chapter pictures. Oh, do oh, my production company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dark Chapter... Pi oh, yeah, DCP. That's right. Dark Chapter Pictures presents Halloween Trick or Treat Motherfucker. <laughs> Could you imagine in theaters October 2025? Oh, my God. That would be so funny. Yeah. Dark Chapter Pictures presents Trick or Treat Motherfucker. Oh, my God. That'd be so good. Yep. We yeah, yeah. I make the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we are officially doing the sequel to Halloween Resurrection. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Uh, super chat from Brandon Collins. Thanks, Brandon. Says, Michael has been in a coma since age four. Jamie is transferred to the same hospital where he is being kept on life support. He wakes up. Hilarity ensues. Uh, so he's back in a coma. Uh, <laughs> or maybe you make Halloween 4 Part 2 a comedy. And you just lean into the, you lean heavily into the stereotypes and into the tropes and, and into the absurdity of the whole thing. Malik wouldn't allow that. I don't think, Ma it depends, right? Like, you know, Malik is essentially the George Lucas, well, n not anymore, but because uh, Disney owns Star Wars now. But for many years, George Lucas, the buck stop was George Lucas. And if you wanted to parody Star Wars, if you wanted to do anything Star Wars, you had to get permission from George Lucas. So when Seth MacFarlane did his, and they're brilliant, by the way, did his Family Guy's uh, Star Wars parodies like 15 years ago, whatever it was, a long time ago now. Uh, I fucking love it. He had to get permission. Uh, and if George Lucas was like, no, then it's no. Uh, thankfully, George Lucas, although he's no doubt shut down a lot of things, I think George Lucas has a good sense of humor. You know, I haven't got any humor. Um, you know, I think he can laugh at himself. He seems a little stiff, you know. But I think if you get if you get him on the right day, I think you'll be like, okay. Um, Malik, I, I'm not saying Malik does not have a great sense of humor, but uh, you would have to, you know, no matter what you do, he has to approve it. Um. But yeah, so I, I uh, yeah, that he's in a coma again. He's in another coma. Oh my God. Oh my God. I don't know, man. Riley O'Brien says, if I had millions, I would pay out of pocket for Dave McRae to direct and produce The Shape. Shit is brilliant. Listening to that is more enjoyable than watching Kills or Ends. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. That's amazing. And I, 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 I'd gladly take it. You'd come on as one of our executive producers. Um, yeah, uh, for those of you that don't know, he's talking about my alternate version of a sequel to Halloween 18. And just to, uh, to say too, it, it, it's not, because um, some people are are discovering it later. So it's, uh, I did that. I recorded all that before there was even an announcement for Halloween Kills and Ends. Now I uploaded it after they made that announcement because I was recording it over like weeks. Um, but yeah, that was my, that was my version of a sequel to Halloween 18 and what, what I, the direction for which I would take it. That doesn't mean there's not things in there that I wouldn't change or alter or, you know, what have you, uh, flesh out a bit more, um, for sure. Uh, but that's the direction I would have gone. You know, I would have put Haddonfield in a thunderstorm with lightning and rain and wind and the leaves blowing and power outages and, oh, fuck, yes, 100%, you know. Now, anytime you, you know, want to show thunderstorms, depending on how much rain you want to show, well, that ups your budget. Anytime you, anytime water makes it into the script, you know, a producer's going to go, uh-huh, Turn the page. How much water are we having here? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And where where's the water being utilized? I mean, you can, you know, again, how much of it, you know, are you showing people out 
in the environment with rain teeming down on them or are they just in their house with rain on the window and most of the thunder or the 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 storm is done through you know sound design with thunder and things like that and rain and of course you would need you know the lights for lightning and stuff and so you know there's variables but uh yeah i'm glad i'm glad that you liked it it was uh um it's it's what i think they should have done it's it's the direction that i think they should have gone. And and if they had asked me what I think we should do, this would have been it. Or that would have been it, for sure. Um, but they didn't do that. Lee the Machine Bauer sends in a very generous super chat of 1999. Thank you, Lee. Says at the end of the at the end of Halloween 2, if the firefighters didn't put the fire out on Michael, he would have been ashes and there would be there wouldn't be a Halloween 4. At the end of... Oh, that that's true. Oh, sorry. I, I was thinking of... Uh, for some reason, I was thinking of Halloween Kills. That is true. Yes. That That is truly... Yeah, no. I mean, it was a raging inferno. It was it was huge. You know, I mean, look at that. If, it's time, Michael. I mean, and one of the great... I mean, shout out to Darren Sands of the Slaughtered Lamb Movie Podcast. It's his favorite firewalk of all time. It's one of the great firewalks. He's he's in, engulfed in this inferno, and I believe Dick Warlock has said he did it two or three times. That's insane. Uh, that's really Dick Warlock. I mean, you can tell he's in the fire, you know, protective suit. Michael looks a little a little chunky walking down that hall, but nonetheless, you suspend your disbelief and it works. And uh, but that's actually Dick Warlock. Not only did he play Michael throughout the movie, he did the firewalk uh, twice, I think. So it's wild. Yeah, no, that's a raging inferno. And even with the amount of fire that is on him, when he collapses to the ground and you just see the mask burning, I mean, by the time, there would be nothing left of his limbs. There'd be nothing left of his hands. So the fact that in Halloween 4, you just see like a little scar on his hand, I mean, like, come on. You know what I mean? But well, I mean, but again, what else are you going to do, right? Uh, like his, he, he would have no hands. He would have no feet. He would be dead. But yes, you are right. You are right. You are correct. Fox Gaming says, just joining this. Uh, would be fun uh, to see a Two Dudes episode. Uh, it would be fun. Excuse me, let me try again. It would be a fun Two Dudes episode, seeing that Four is Tony's favorite. For sure. Well, I think we've talked a bit about this. Uh, you are right, by the way, for sure. Uh, but there are episodes of Two Dudes where we've talked about this. I think there might have even been a one. It, we did a series of what if episodes last year and the year before where we talked about, you know, what if scenarios. And I believe Daniel Harris and Rachel Carruthers coming back for an alternate reality Halloween uh, five essentially, a sequel to Halloween 4, uh, was one of the topics. Oh, yeah, no, we've talked... Dwight H. Little mentioning this is nothing new. It, it, I don't, it, it's nothing new at all. The fan base has been talking about this what-if scenario for years. Uh, so, but it, I, I admit it's, it's, it's pretty cool to hear that the director of Halloween 4 has also thought about it and pitched it. Uh, you know... For me to get more excited about it, though, I just need more information. When was the pitch? How long ago? To who? You know, because people pitch everything all the time. Like in show business, you having a conversation, there's formal pitches and then there's informal pitches, right? And the formal pitches are like, you know, the reason you're there. You know, you're there because you have your lookbook and you have your, you know, pitch deck. You, you, you have, like I said, a business proposal, essentially, you know, is what that is for, for your idea and for your film. And you've been brought to the studio to sit down in an office. You have a meeting. It's a, that's why you're there. You're there to pitch your idea to the studio executives that are sitting in front of you. Well, that's a pitch. And then there's probably... What happens almost every single day, uh, well, maybe not, maybe not. No, I take that back. But then there's the informal pitches, which are, you know, you're hanging out with your fellow producer and you pitch him an idea that's been on your mind. I pitched Bruce an idea the other day. We're two filmmakers. We're two producers. We run our own production company. We're in post-production on a short film right now that we're, that, we're, that we're about to release to the world in October. And I was over at his place. I wasn't there for any other reason than, you know, it's me, Billy, chapter two. We were sitting at his 
kitchen table and we were talking and I said, hey, you know what? I have this idea. And he's like, oh yeah? I was like, yeah. So tell me what you think of this. I pitched it to him. And he was like, that's great. That's actually really good. I pitched it. That's a pitch, right? So that's the thing, right? We don't know to what level was this pitch, how in depth was the pitch, how, how fleshed out are his ideas, right? And to who did he pitch it? Danielle? Ellie? Malik? Jason Blum? A studio executive? His fellow filmmaker buddy? We don't know. Again, when... But to be fair, to be fair, because again, I like to go to the extreme to make a point, right? Because I like to paint a picture, a broad picture. To be fair, in the way that the interview was conducted and in the way that he he spoke, uh, it, it, it insinuates that he's pitched it to somebody in a certain level of authority with the Halloween franchise. That's how it reads, of course. That's how it comes across. To be fair, you have to credit or credit. To be fair, I get it. But we still don't know who... And how long ago? Was this recently well, while the whole Miramax thing was happening? Or was this 20 years ago? We have no idea. We have no idea. Uh, all right. Uh, David. Uh, David, yes, yeah, says, Dave, I tried several other Super Chats. I want to figure out another way to send you donations as my subsequent Super Chats attempt are failing. I don't know why that is, David. Uh, I don't have a donate button. Like I, I don't have a PayPal button or a donate button. Uh, you should be able to donate even after as well. You can donate uh, a Super Chat, I think, on a video after the fact as well, I think. Uh, let me look into it. Uh, David, because you should be able to send super chats without issue. There's not a limit. There's not a there's not a limit to how much you can send. I mean, there's a limit to how much you can send at once. I just mean there isn't a limit to how much you can send over and over. There isn't a limit, you know. So I don't I don't know why, uh, David. But you know, we'll we'll keep chatting and we'll we'll see if we can get this figured out. Because um, I'm not somebody. I know some people put donation buttons in the uh in the description like you know uh send me uh you know send to my paypal for you know treat me to a coffee or you know whatever it is i haven't done that i i don't i don't i haven't done that because i don't feel the need to do that, I, that that's what the super chats are for and the and uh and the memberships and all that kind of stuff but i'm not like I'd, i'm not against it i just don't know if it would be worth it uh to do that um but who knows who knows but let's let's get this figured out david because i know this isn't the first time you brought to my attention so I, I i appreciate your patience things have just been really busy with me so i do appreciate your patience let's see if we can get this figured out because there's there's got to be a way to 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 fix this um it's got to be a way uh lee the machine bauer sends in 999 thank you lee says for chester if halloween for uh for oh for chester had had oh, okay Thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. Uh, it says, uh, if Halloween 4 Part 2 happens, can you see Alan Howarth and Tom Morga coming back for, uh, even though Tom is 82? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe they'd want to get the band back together again. I could see. Yeah. Do I think it's possible? Yes. Um, maybe Morga comes back as like a cameo. He's not Michael. He's he's like, you know, the gas station attendant. He's the convenience the the the, uh, the convenience store clerk. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, Alan Howarth coming back to score. Yeah, maybe. Do I think it's possible? I think it's possible. Do I think it's likely? I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. I'm not really sure. Um, let me see. Uh, let me just scroll back. I want to get some that I haven't seen before and some non-Super Chat ones. Uh, it's good to see some new faces in here. That's great. Um, you guys talking amongst each other. That's great too. Just looking for if there's a question. No, it doesn't look like, I mean, I'm sure they're worth throughout the whole thing. But of course, while I was doing my, my commentary, um, here's somebody I haven't seen in, or have I seen somebody? Troy Stasha? Is that how you say that, Troy? It says, it will never happen. Halloween 4 is too niche and doesn't have enough appeal for the wider general public. It's a fun idea, though. I could not agree more. I could not agree more, Troy. 100%. But I do think there. I'm leaving a little wiggle room for a possible miniseries or straight-to-streaming film as like a, again, leaning into what it is. It's a special one-off event kind of thing. Uh, but a theatrically released 
major sequel across 3,500 theaters with a $30 million marketing campaign and a $15 million budget like the other Halloween films that just came out? Not a fucking hope in hell. No way. Ain't happening. No. 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 Don't see it. Um, all right. Let me see here. Bum bum bum. Uh, Fox Gaming says, love your insight and commentary on things, Dave. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, I enjoy listening to you during work. It makes the shift go by faster. Keep, bring, keep being awesome. Uh, thank you, Fox Gaming. Appreciate that. I'm glad that I'm able to help your, uh, your day go by a little faster. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, oh, uh, Troy says, uh, hey, uh, thanks, Dave. Yes, typo, typo. Pronounced my last name is correct. Okay, great. Awesome. Troy Stasha. Awesome. That, that's a good last name. Stasha. Troy Stasha. I like that last name. Uh, it's got some oomph to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I agree, basically. You know what you're saying. I, 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 don't, I don't think there's a hope in hell. I really don't. Um, again, I leave a little wiggle room on a like a special kind of fan event kind of thing. You know what I mean? Kind of a fun thing. Because uh, you never know. But uh, I, But even then, I think the probability is very low. I, I do. I think it's fun to think about. I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's fun to think about, but I, I, I just don't see it. I just don't see it happening. I just don't. And, you know, again, I, as, as much as it would be cool to do it in fan film form, I don't have an interest to do it because I want to go on now and make movies where I can actually seek distribution from. Um, and when I mean that, I mean like actually, you know, seek distribution like i can get it in stores or get it on streaming or whatever right with billy even though it's me billy chapter one and two are professional products in terms of their production value and 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 you know the whole thing unfortunately they have to remain for free so they have to be on um i wonder if tubi's i wonder if tubi's an option i don't know i'd have to look into that Probably not. Probably not. You watch things for free, but they would, they make money off it. They are still making money through advertising off of it being on there. So no, no, you couldn't do that. Um, but anyway, yeah. So it has to remain on YouTube and Vimeo just because, you know, it's a fan film. Um, but yeah, no, I want to go on now and do like, you know, films that I can, I can actually get paid, not only make money from, but actually get paid to make. Because there is no way in hell I am working ever again as hard as I have. Now, let, let, let me also say too, that doesn't mean like, again, I'm, I'm painting a very black and white scenario. I'm not saying that I will never do a passion project again for free or help somebody out for free. or like what, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in the producer, director, writer role, uh, helming a project, I can't like I it, it's 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 there's too much work when you're making something at this level and it's like if I'm going to invest this much time and energy into something well let's get paid to do it and let's make a movie we can seek distribution with right so yeah but uh but very happy how how these uh, two films are or I guess we're still in post on chapter two but uh this has been a lot of fun you know my my journey with the it's me Billy uh with you know the two films has been a heck of a journey it's been it's been a lot of fun um and uh and I feel and it was the perfect project for us uh because it allowed us to play in a sandbox to deliver something pro to showcase what we can do uh, and to do something special for Black Christmas and for, you know, yeah, it's 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 really cool. It, it's been such a cool journey, and it's not over. You never know what's going to happen. It's not over. Um, let me see. Uh, all right, what time is it? Oh, I gotta go. I gotta go. Uh, I'll go another like couple minutes, and then I have to skedaddle. Um, Christopher Ruggiero says fan films can be just as good quality as full length movies. They can be. I mean, it, it depends what we're talking about, right? Like, it, you know, one of the things on the last episode of McRae Live, um, uh, one of the things I talked about because it was a question that I got asked a lot when the, um, uh, the trailer released for that 
uh, mascot horror movie, Mickey's Mousetrap, right? Because Steamboat Willie is now in the public domain and blah, blah, blah. And I got a few DMs from people. I think it was on Twitter, actually. Not DMs, but ads. Uh, somebody asked me, they said, hey, I just watched this movie to, you know, or this trailer to Mickey's Mousetrap. And the quality looks like it looks like the sound is not very good. And it just looks like a real C amateur kind of thing. And I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen the trailer yet. And they said, how come your film, you know, looks like studio, but you know, but you're a fan film and all that. Anyway. So I took time to basically say that, um, when you're on the indie scene, especially you're dealing with many different levels of budgets. And I don't know how much Mickey's mousetrap cost, but the reason why It's Me Billy Chapter 1 or It's Me Billy Chapter 2 or films like Never Hike Alone, Never Hike Alone 2, Dylan's New Nightmare, the reason why there is there's such a professional uh, sheen to them in terms of production value and it looks studio is because of where we have chosen to allocate the money, right? How you invest that money, where you choose to allocate your budget and that money can determine a lot, right? And so sometimes when people get $100,000 to play with, they choose to invest it in other things that won't necessarily up their production value, right? And then other people will choose to invest in certain things that will up the production value. And when I say up production value, I don't mean explosions and car crashes. I mean, you know, shooting on cinematic grade cameras, hiring professionals that work in the business, that do it every day, not your friend down the street that's going to hold, you know, a boom mic. I'm talking about hiring a professional sound recorders and boom operator who knows how to capture professional sound on set because they it's their job. They do it all the time and they do it at the professional level, right? So you choose to invest into somebody who knows how to do that. You choose to invest in a director of photography who knows how to shoot movies, who actually shoots movies, right? You invest in professional actors, you invest in, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, right? And then, and then post, how are you investing that money in post-production, right? All that kind of stuff. So two productions can have the same budget, and one can look studio quality and the other one can look kind of like it was shot with your friends in your backyard. And that will primarily come down to where that money was allocated. How did the two productions choose to invest that money? Because uh, that's that's huge. That's huge, right? Uh, huge, you know? Are they shooting it on their phone or are they shooting it on, you know, the Aerie Alexa, right? I mean, it's, that's two completely different things, right? So, um very different, very different. Because they may choose to, no, we want to, we, uh, we want to invest in blood and gore. We want to invest in kills. We want to invest in, you know, we're going to have uh, somebody's uh, arm get torn off. So we're going to have to spend $10,000 to make that happen or whatever, right? And maybe that's where some productions choose to invest their money, right? Is in that kind of thing, right? So you watch the movie and the production value is kind of, B movie, C doesn't really feel, doesn't feel, you know, it, but, but the kills are wild and there's so much blood and gore. And, you know, again, I'm just giving surface level examples, right? Because maybe that's where they chose to invest their money instead of hiring, you know, professional crew, you know, whatever the case is, right? I'm not saying that's what Mickey's Mousetrap did. I'm just saying that that sometimes when you watch certain movies that sometimes you're like, well, well, wait a minute. So this movie had $150,000 and this movie had $150,000 and yet there's such a difference in the production value. And it's like, well, that's why. That's why. Because one movie chose to invest one way and the other movie chose to invest another way. I mean, so, um, but so when it comes to fan films, there's such a spectrum, right? There's fan films, there's the, there's fan films that are the good old fan films, which are in your backyard with your friends, bad acting, terrible lighting, one master shot for 10 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those are the good old days, right? And they still exist, right? They're fun. And then there's, you know, sort of mid-tier, right? Where you can tell, oh, this is competently made. Like they put a lot of effort into this, right? They, they yeah, they put, a, you know, but it still looks, still kind of has that fan film thing, right? And then there's, of course, what myself and 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 Cecil and and Vince have done, which of course is is uh, I mean, we're shooting real films. They just 
we have to put that label on it because we don't own the IP. Uh, but in terms of the production value and the equipment and the actors and, and you know, all that kind of stuff, it's, it's totally pro. Uh, and, and, but we also understand that not everybody has access to that. Not everybody works in the industry. Not everybody has access to be able to hire the right people. Not everybody has uh, the access to the equipment rentals and all that kind of stuff, right? There's a, there's a varying degree. But, but listen, I've watched what I call mid-tier you know, fan films that look really good. Like totally, like it looks, it looks really good. Right. Uh, that have been great, have been really great. A hundred percent. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's edited well. It's shot well, you know, sometimes the acting cause they're using their friends, but, but it, but it looks good. Like it looks good. Totally looks good. Um, and there's, there's so, so there's such a spectrum there. Do you know what I mean? Uh, the, the, the higher tier, the higher tier fan films, like your Billy's, you know, and uh, and your never hike alones and uh, et cetera are 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 much harder to achieve because uh, it, it takes a certain level of industry experience and professional connections and professional understanding and knowing absolutely where to allocate that money and and all that kind of they're 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 not as there aren't as many of you know of those obviously uh because uh it takes a certain level of of all that to be able to make it happen and also too there's a lot of people that feel well if i have this money i'm not going to make a fan film i'm going to go off and make you know an original film right there's that too so you know what I mean? Um, but no, you're right. There are, there are some good, there are some good what if fan films out there that are a lot of fun to watch for sure. I absolutely agree a hundred percent and anybody, and I don't care if you're making a fucking movie on your phone in your backyard, you know, with your friends, or if you're a mid tier or whatever the case is, I don't care, man. Making movies is hard and you're putting yourself out there and you're doing the best you can and you're bringing it every day and you're making something that you're passionate about and I think that's awesome. I mean, listen, it, we have a camera in our pocket now. It's, it's wild. It's wild. It's wild. So shout out, man. Shout out to everybody. Um, uh, da -da 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 Lee the Machine Bowers sends in a very generous super chat of forty nine ninety nine. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate that. It's incredible. Uh, again, for the channel, Dave... It's going into the channel. Have an amazing day. Congrats on the wrap uh, of IMB2. Cheers. Uh, P.S. Frank Riker should be in a Halloween 4 part 2. He gets revenge on Kelly Meeker. Death, uh, death, much love. Uh, oh, Kelly Meeker's death. Much love, my friend. Thank you, Lee. I really appreciate that. You're a very generous supporter, and uh, I sincerely appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and yes, I could not agree with you more. Frank Riker should be in Halloween 4 Part 2. Uh, him and Kelly Meeker should have a hot tub scene. No, Kelly Meeker's dead. He should have a hot tub scene, uh, and the ghost of Kelly Meeker arises beside him. And they have a conversation. Frank, I don't know if you're watching, but what do you think of that? <laughs> what do you think of that? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Totally. Um, I appreciate the very generous super chat, uh, Lee. Thank you so much. Um, all right, folks, listen. Um, oh, Joshua Graham. One of our members says, I've been watching since the lead up to 2018. Love the stuff, Dave. Can't wait for it to be Billy too. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Terrence Howell says, not saying that in condescending manner, like legit. What's going on? Uh, Terrence says, it goes toward the movie, not the personal use. I'm guessing that's it in relation to Blu-rays and DVDs. Oh, must be talking about something else. Um, oh, I guess you guys are talking amongst each other. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but uh, you're talking amongst each other. Steve Ross says, you and Bruce deserve to be paid on your next project. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, no, listen, this is, look, we do not regret it. Like guys, we do not, re I'm just stating facts. I'm stating facts. I'm stating things and realities about the business and about the situation and about where we are, right? So we're now at a point where we feel comfortable uh, stepping into a situation where we can now seek real, not real funding, obviously what we raise is real funding, but I mean like, like, like big funding, 
right? You know what I mean? Like maybe we'll be able to get like, you know, a couple million dollars or something, right? And 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 to put forward and to put into action, uh, you know, a project that we're passionate about, that we want to put our heart into and something we can get paid to work on and make it the best that we possibly can. And then, you know, and, you know, I'll be talking about it here on the channel when I have the time, of course, right? You know, and get you guys excited about it and and something we can complete and finish and seek distribution. I mean, that's that's the dream, right? That's that's the dream that I and Bruce and 9 billion, there's not even nine, there's not even 9 billion, 9 million uh, other filmmakers out there in our position want to do as well, right? You know what I mean? I mean, that's the dream, right? The dream is to be able to, you know, make movies, follow your passion, follow your heart. And that's why I say like anybody, I don't care what level of fan film you're making, right? Because I understand not everybody is able to do what, what we can do because they don't have either the experience or, or the, or the, um, uh, the knowledge or the access to the resources. I, I understand that. Like, I'm not like I, you know, I totally get it. Um, but my hat sincerely goes off to anybody who's putting themselves out there, who's making movies and, Fucking good movies too. Like you don't need to have, like again, folks, you don't need to have $100,000 to make a great movie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't. You just have to have a, an understanding of how movies are made, understanding how, you know, uh, you know, to be able to craft your shots and, and, and lighting and, and, and lenses and like, you just have to understand how to make movies. Right. And you can make a really great movie for fucking 500 bucks. If you know what you're doing, I don't mean you can make a great feature film for 500 bucks, but you, I mean, you can make a great little like lights. Look at that fucking David Sandberg's short film lights out. If you know what you're doing, you can make a good movie. So I'm just saying my hat goes off to anybody who, who is putting themselves out there and, and because it's not easy, right? It's, you know, to put yourselves out there, to make a movie you're passionate about, that you're excited about. So, and that goes to everybody, man. Like sincerely, like it's, 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 it's not easy. It's, it's, it's much, it's much easier to be a Monday morning quarterback and a bitch and moan and complain about this stuff, but it's a hell of a lot harder to put yourself out there and be vulnerable and, you know, and, 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 and make something you're passionate about and then put it out to the world and let the chips fall where they may. So if you're somebody that's done that, and I don't give a fuck if, like what tier or what level you're working at. If you're somebody that's done that, and I'm not even just talking about fan films. I'm talking about just like making movies. My hat goes off to you because it's tough. Making movies is tough and it's not easy. And uh, so, you know, I sincerely mean that. Um, ba -da -bum, ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Fandom Empire, Sean Giroux. I think it's Sean anyway. It might not be. I don't know. It might be. It might be one of the other crew. Phantom Empire is here. It says, hey, Dave, hope all is well. Excited for IMB2. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I have nothing but love for Halloween 4. It's my favorite in the franchise. However, the way Dwight pitched it doesn't work, in my opinion. Stay safe on the roads, mate. Thank you. Yeah, the roads are pretty windy out there. You are correct. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, I appreciate that. And, uh, well, I, there, there, there really wasn't much of a pitch, right? It was just sort of, uh, you know, he had an idea, um that he'd like to bring Ellie and Daniel back. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I, it's, 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 this is only news because the director of Halloween four said he made a pitch. But like I said earlier, we don't, we don't know with whom that pitch was to. We don't know how long ago that pitch was, uh, how involved, you know, was it? Did he have, I would imagine that it, if he actually had a, a lookbook or something, he would have said it. Um, I gather this was just, he has an idea that would be really cool and he's pitched it to somebody, but how long ago was it? I don't know. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not overly excited. I mean, we've been talking about this as fans. I mean, in the Halloween community, this idea of an alternate reality, alternate, you know, Halloween five uh, has been around for years. This is nothing new. I know it's a little more exciting because, oh, Dwight Little mentioned it. I totally get it. I understand it. But beyond that, there's not a lot of meat on the bone here. There really isn't. There's not a lot of meat on the bone. Do you know what I mean? Not a whole lot anyway. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I... Listen, as a Halloween fan, I'd watch it for sure. Yeah, I'd watch it. We know Danielle would be in it in a heartbeat. She'd do it. 100% she'd do it. The question is, would Ellie Cornell do it? Because as Brandon Collins pointed out earlier in the show, she's, you know, she's retired. She does local theater from time to time, but she runs a bed and breakfast in Nantucket apparently, and she's retired. So, I mean, you know, 
can potentially bring anybody out of retirement, but she might not have an interest. That's something that fans often don't, well, you don't want, I don't, I don't get it. You're Rachel. I, yeah, but sometimes, I mean, actors don't get nearly as attached to the roles they play as the fans do. So she may be like, oh, I'm good. Yeah, but Danielle's back. I, that's great. No, I'm good. But maybe she would come back. Who knows? But if she does, if they do it, well, we'll be talking about it on the channel. We'll be talking about it on the channel. You never, ever know. You never, ever know. Uh, Loomis screams, get out. Get out. Get out now. Uh, congratulations, Dave, on IMB2. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Loomis screams. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, all right, folks, listen, that is going to do it for me here on episode 236 of McRae Live. Thank you for tuning in and listening to me rant and ramble and shoot from the hip and blah, 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 blah. You know me. That's how I am here on the channel. Uh, I appreciate all of you for tuning in. I mean that. Remember, we don't always have to agree. That's what the comment section is for. Keep it civil, though. Keep it professional. I have no issues with people debating or disagreeing with me. Uh, but make sure you just, you know, you keep it, like you keep it adult. You know what I mean? You keep it mature, you know? Uh, sometimes you got to say that. Sometimes you got to say it. Uh, but yeah, jump into the comment section below and let me know your thoughts on Dwight H. Little, the director of Halloween 4, mentioning that, you know what? I'm ready to do a Halloween 4.2. Like I'm, or, or four part, part four, part two, whatever. I'm ready. And I even, I have an idea and I wouldn't, my, what do you think? Is this something you want to see? Do you want to see it? Do you not want to see it? What do you agree with or disagree with, with anything I've had to say here today? Let me know in the comment section below. I would love to know your thoughts. Thank you, of course, to my great, mo uh, my great moderators, Frank Riker, Tab of the Short, Darren Sands, Chris Baber, and Cody Snyder. Thank you for doing what you guys do. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all my channel members out there as well. Uh, I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Uh, if you want to become a, a crazy member here on the channel, just hit the join button uh, and you can become one. So uh, that would be fun to uh, get more uh, more people on board with that as well. And, uh, and thank you to all the super chats that came in today as well. I really, really appreciate it. So uh, have a great rest of your Sunday, a great rest of your weekend, what's left of it. And uh, I will talk to you all very soon. Halloween 4 part Part two? I don't know. Jump into the comment section. Let me know your thoughts. Alrighty, folks. In the meantime and in between time, I will talk to you soon. Cheers.